When I was a kid, I would hear the name Judy Feldkar, but I never really understood what she did. Never really understood her accomplishments. Maybe around 10 years ago, I saw her interviewed on the Strombo Show, and I thought, wow. Wow. And now that I've taken a deep dive into her life, she's modeled for me something so inspiring, that engagement leading towards empathy. To buy a human being is the worst thing that you can think of. Sometimes, when you hear a quote or an interview as a journalist, it just stays in your gut, and you can't shake it off you. So when I heard about Judy Feld Carr and what she went through, I thought, how can someone do so much with their life? The lessons learned from Judy's story is reminiscent of this quote by Teddy Roosevelt. Far and away, the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. For Judy Feldkar. Tel Aviv, June 1996, a warm night. Music streaming through a packed ballroom. 200 people dancing the hora to celebrate a wedding few will ever forget. Syrian men sing Hava Nagila or Let Us Rejoice. Syrian women swirl and sashay their dresses. Kids chase each other between parents' legs. When the dancing segues to the bride and groom lifted up on chairs, their smiles crease wide and holy, hands clenching across a sea of men holding up the chair legs. Bride and groom are lowered, and then the bride's father is given the uplifting honor. While held high, he's joined in the air by a woman hoisted up on a chair. A buzz electrifies the hall. Whispers of, who is that white woman, hopscot from one table to the next. The answers come with a grin. That's Miss Judy. And Miss Judy Feld Carr is dancing in the air with Selim Swed, one of the 3,228 Syrian Jews she rescued from Syria starting in the 70s. Here to celebrate Selim's daughter's wedding, Judy is then lowered down and quickly faces a 30-deep line of Syrians, mainly from Damascus. They are itching to thank her for saving them and their family from the torture and degradation of being Jewish in Syria. She's been called Queen Esther, the female Moses, a hero who never wanted to be blinded by the spotlight, the most guarded secret in the Jewish world. And when the 3,228 Syrian Jew boarded a plane to New York, one of the most clandestine operations in Canada was now etched in the history books with a critical chapter to this fascinating story. Judy used secret code and underground channels to smuggle men, women, and children out of a country that wanted to hold them hostage until their deaths. For years, in Syria, Jews watched their civil liberties vanish. They couldn't leave the country without permission. Their religion was listed on ID cards, which no other citizen faced. House searches without warrants were as common as pizza and hummus. They couldn't own businesses by themselves, requiring a Muslim Syrian to own half the company. Jewish residents of Aleppo, Kamishli, and Damascus could only live in specific neighborhoods. And anyone who resisted, tried to leave the country without permission, faced the kind of torture designed to graveyard any ambition to escape. Today, those tortured Syrians can't swim with their kids because they are triggered by the waterboarding they endured. They flinch when they hear the flick of a cigarette lighter, remembering how their toes were burnt by Zippos. Even a flat tire on the road can seize their breasts because they remember how security guards forced them through suspended car tires and whipped the soles of their feet. Back in the 70s, Judy's late husband, Reuben Feld, said about the trapped Syrians, we must not forget about these Jews, for if we do, their blood will be on our hands. We must not forget about these Jews of despair. Judy and Reuben didn't forget. 
And they implored Canadian Jews and politicos to shake off their blinders and look beyond their borders. They pleaded with Canada to stop ignoring the warnings of never again. When Judy's husband Rubenfeld died suddenly, some thought that campaign would lose momentum. But Judy, huh, you don't know Judy if you thought she was going to give up. There's a wonderful Italian phrase, salto mortale, a dangerous leap. Judy left when many of us would have shaken our head, peered over the edge, and said, no way. She worked day and night to contact rabbis in Syria to help her smuggle Jews out of the country. She quickly learned about the commerce of emigration in the Middle East. Money talked, and then Jews could walk wherever they wanted. Judy won't tell me the total amount sent overseas, but it's easier to figure out, you know, it's in the millions or so. As much as Judy needed money to bribe security guards and border officials, she also needed to build a network of communication, a way to find out who needed the most help. Inspired by the guarded dialogue used between Jews during the Spanish Inquisition, Judy wrote secret messages cloaked in biblical verse on the inside covers of religious books sent from Ontario to Syria. These verses spoke of hope, redemption, escaping from oppressors. Judy would send to Syria's rabbi Psalm 121, verse 2. My feet stand outside your gates, O Jerusalem. The rabbis would reply with Psalm 11, verse 1. My eyes to turn towards the mountain, from where will my help come? Syria's CIA equivalent, the Muhabarak, grilled the rabbis on these messages. So what do they really mean? The rabbis replied, meh, traditional Jewish greetings. When I asked Judy to explain how she went all spy master, she shakes her head, says she can't get into it, and that's that. She's not being difficult for the sake of it. Her secrecy comes from history urging Jews to never reveal their homemade weapons. If we don't cloak the dagger built to pick the lock shackling our people, it could get stolen by the wrong hands, rendering it useless. In 1983, Judy had to delay her father's own funeral by an hour because she was sprinting to banks to wire funds for a rescue underway. She remembers, I couldn't even tell my mother about it. It all had to be so secret. Another way that Judy saved lives was by covertly supplying essentials via guards that she bribed. One woman, a new mom while in jail, languished in a soil cell on false charges. Judy bribed guards to deliver milk formula for the baby and oranges for the mother. This bribery was sadly all too common. In Judaism, it's a mitzvah to ransom a captive, what's known as pidyun shuvayim. But Judy felt an unsavory mix of melancholy and pride in her stomach all those years ago, saving all those Jews. To fully commit yourself to the dangers coming at you from all sides, many of us can't relate to that leap. Judy says she lived a double life. Sudbury raised mother of six in Toronto, one life. Secret spy and savior, bribing guards and buying children, another life. Which got me thinking. To stand up to dictators, boasting inflated egos and small minds, to cloak yourself in the shadows and do your life's work there, that is zulatanut, altruism. That is putting others' lives before your own no matter the cost. And the cost to Judy? a flood of death threats once she went public with everything she did. How many of us live one life and we think, that's it, I'm doing what I can to get by, whatever that means to me. But should we be looking beyond the everyday to find an opportunity to refresh someone else's life? It's not as easy as pressing command R in your browser. I should know. I've been wondering if this poetry slam thing I run, this spoken word thing I do, this journalism career, is it changing more lives than one? Again, not easy to answer. 
but at least I'm asking the question. I'd rather be the satyr boy who asks questions than the one who doesn't know how to ask any at all. In dozens of Syrian Jewish homes in the U.S., Israel, and Canada live, Sir- live mothers and daughters with an impressively unsyrian name, Judy. That weighty honor ensures Judy Zula Tanut lives on and on for future generations to admire and appreciate. Now that is Judaism. <laughs> so, to honor Judy... To honor the rescuer of those Jews of despair, I say to life, L'chaim.